tonight on Sightings. From the land that first celebrated Halloween, a Scottish castle that's terrorized locals for hundreds of years. Tonight, we send a team of paranormal experts to flush out the ghosts of Scotland's House of Horror. Then, some claim real-life vampires still exist today. We uncover startling new evidence of the living dead. <laughs> Welcome to a special Halloween edition of Sightings. I'm Tim White. Tonight, you'll meet real-life vampires and modern-day witches living right here in the United States. But first, Sightings travels to Stirling Castle, Scotland's reputed house of horror. This Scottish castle is rumored to be the most haunted place on Earth. It's a fitting beginning, since the origins of Halloween can be traced back to Scotland in the third century. Scotland, Ireland, and Great Britain were home to the Druids, an ancient people who began the celebration of the holiday we now call Halloween. The Druids believed that Halloween, actually New Year's Eve by their calendar, was the one night of the year when spirits, both good and evil, were allowed to roam the earth. You're at wandering around on the night on Halloween when the dead are coming back from the grave. You don't want them to recognize you because they might do something to you or they might take you back with them. Good spirits were welcomed into druid homes with treats. The evil spirits were on fires and frightening masks. Later, jack-o'-lanterns were used to keep away evil spirits. But these talismans aren't always successful. At Stirling Castle in Scotland, more than a thousand people a year report seeing and feeling evil spirits, and not just on Halloween. In fact, since Stirling Castle was first built to defend the Scottish countryside in the 15th century, Countless eyewitnesses have reported seeing ghosts, evil spirits, poltergeists, and demons. I saw a shadow, no face, just a dark shadow in the corner. When I looked back again, there was absolutely nothing. I've been walking around there at night, and I felt a presence. I felt someone behind me. Wasn't exactly on the ground. She was kind of floating, but she had her face away from me. It definitely was a woman. Very scary. Makes you cold. I know what I saw. The best known ghost in Stirling Castle is the Green Lady. And uh, she is said to be the spirit of um, a servant maid who saved Mary Queen of Scots from death in 1661 when her bed, the bed curtains uh, caught fire um, from a naked flame, a candle held beside the bed. Um, her spirit is said still to haunt Stirling Castle today. What we saw just at the corner of the graveyard, up at the foot of the castle wall, was a green, a lady dressed in green. It seemed to be glowing. There were seven or eight of us ran up to see what was going on. We were covering 25 yards. There was nobody in either direction. I can't think of any other castle who actually has a photograph of one of the ghosts. And we have a photograph of a Highlander here marching out of the castle. And you can see straight through him as he comes underneath the archway. We sent the, uh, the photograph away and it was tested and it wasn't a double negative. It hadn't been uh, superimposed on top of it or anything. So that's why we believe it was uh, actually a picture of the ghost. Trying to make contact with ghosts at a site such as Stirling Castle can be approached in several different ways by both scientists and spiritualists. We brought two separate investigative teams to Stirling, each operating independently but both with the same end in mind, tangible evidence of at least some of the 100 ghosts rumored to live here. Internationally respected psychical researcher Tony Cornell came to Stirling from Cambridge, searching for scientific evidence. One thing about the whole psychic field is it's full of contradictions. You can go to one case and say, ah, oh, this is absolute rubbish. This is imagination. This is nonsense. You go to another one and you get a pearl of information. It's all right, we can't ignore this. So I should think, really, I'd say there are such things as ghosts. I've never seen one. I'd very much like to see one. Perhaps I might see one tonight. You never know. Tony Cornell asked London's premier spiritualist medium, Glyn Edwards, to help him choose a good location for an overnight surveillance. 
There's something here. There's definitely something here. Here? What about over here? Not so much here. Not so much here. When we go out on an investigation, uh, the kind of equipment we're taking is purely simply to confirm the physical presence of it. Um, is it in the mind of the person or is it a real physical object? So what we do is we take equipment that will record any changes in the physical environment. Sound, sight, heat, geomagnetic changes, uh, any, uh, any form of electrical change, because we don't know what makes these things occur. So we want to know if we leave this stuff behind, do ghosts then appear, or do they only appear because there's a human being there? Well, this is the kind of thing we want to confirm with the instrumentation. Cornell set up an infrared camera and a standard video camera to be left on all night. The next day, the video revealed nothing extraordinary, but the audio portion was startling. No one was in the castle. The lone night watchman was far from the recording site. The nearest road was more than a mile away. Listen again for what sounds like moaning and screaming among the electronic static. Could these be the ghostly voices of Stirling Castle's tortured dead? Two days after the haunting sounds were recorded, sightings brought in a second team, comprised of psychics and headed by paranormal researcher Malcolm Robinson. They hoped to find additional evidence of ghost activity. Their investigation took place near the recording site in the castle's old prison, called the Toll Booth. We go along and investigate these cases, speak with the people involved to ascertain um, if indeed there are something of a psychic nature happening. This group of psychic investigators uses a controversial and often dangerous technique called spirit rescue. In a rescue, the psychics attempt to become temporarily possessed by any spirits that may be present. They believe the tortured spirits inside them can then be released into another dimension. On this night, world-renowned psychic Rosemary Todlin claimed one ancient tortured spirit had entered her body. They were attacking me. They were bringing me back. They were attacking me. They were bringing me back. Rosemary appeared to be speaking as a centuries-old prisoner who had been tortured in Stirling Castle. While she was in her trance, other psychics attempted to liberate the supposed spirit from her and rid it from the castle. You might never get another chance. This is your chance. This is your chance. This is your chance to be free once and for all. Spit it out if you have to. This is where you take that step through the door, a bigger door beyond even that, a much greater door, filled with light. That I actually felt escape. I felt it physically and I felt it emotionally. And the pressure began to just evaporate from me. Do you feel that the spirit has been released then from this room. He's no longer here as far as I'm concerned. So you're I quite am... sure of this? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. He wanted out and he got an out. He got that door that he wanted. Yeah. There's no way to come back here. Yeah. We know there were torture chambers in the toll booth. And indeed, if they followed the practice of the country at that particular time and endowed over many, many years, then there's no doubt there were thumb screws and practices within that toll booth to force confessions from the unfortunate inhabitants. I think what we've had here is a little bit dubious. I mean, I get the feeling of, no, it's, it's too melodramatic. Sincere, yes, but I don't think it was correct. But that's not saying that there aren't things in Stirling Castle. Of course there are, because many sane and sensible people have walked around and seen these things. There may be conflicting views on the merits of spirit rescue, but Malcolm Robinson and his team of psychics believe that there is now one less ghost in Stirling Castle, that they have relieved the suffering of one tortured spirit in Scotland's House of Horrors. Coming up next, some claim real-life vampires still exist today. We uncover startling new evidence of the living dead. And later, a revealing interview with a modern-day witch.
On Halloween, the streets are filled with ghosts and goblins and vampires. But Sightings has discovered that at least some of those vampires aren't out there dressing up for just one holiday. We found people who are so obsessed with vampires that they've chosen to live as though they are real life vampires. Do vampires really exist? Bella Lugosi's theatrical vision of the vampire debuted in the film classic Dracula. Lugosi is the most popular image that we have of the nocturnal beast that preys on the living. Our reaction is a mixture of fascination and revulsion as Dracula thirsts for human blood. Let me live, please! Punish me, torture me, but let me live! Bram Stoker's Dracula from Francis Ford Coppola is the newest of nearly 2,000 Dracula movies produced worldwide. Evidence of our continuing fascination with the undead. <laughs> The undead would be someone who is, is pronounced dead, and uh, at certain times, the dead corpse reanimates and goes out with a thirst for human blood. Recent studies by researchers at two major universities in the United States show that nearly half the adult population of the United States believe that the world of the undead, in some form, is real. And that same research shows that our obsession with vampires is rising dramatically. The vampire represents uh, uh, the, the darker side of human instinct. The vampire represents the semi-animal-like quality that is part of our nature, but which in the cultural process of growth and development, we have had to forego. Ordinary people go see vampires because they identify with a certain uh, collection of characteristics that they don't live out, but which are ignited in what we would call their unconscious. The Dracula character in Bram Stoker's novel was based on the 15th century Romanian warlord Vlad the Impaler. Stoker took the ancient myths about this notorious killer and added elements of the supernatural. Rosemary, the historical Vlad, Vlad the Impaler, he was not a vampire. Vlad Tepish was not a vampire. He was uh, a real person, a 15th century Wallachian warlord who was a very cruel and despotic man. And Bram Stoker took him as the historical model for Count Dracula. There's only one existing account of him drinking blood, and it was the blood of one of his impaled victims. So this does not make him a vampire. Do you really believe, Rosemary, that there are vampires, real vampires? I do believe in the possibility of real vampires. I would call a real vampire a non-physical being, perhaps the spirit of a dead or some other kind of being that uh, would attack the living during the day or the evening, almost uh, what we would call a biting poltergeist. Around uh, the world, there are many cultures that believe that there are individuals who can fly out at night in some form. There is certainly a possibility that there are many other forms of energy, many other forms of power that we just don't understand that may form the basis of the vampire legend and may actually form some kind of power for real vampires. As people grow more frightened and as the normal structures of life, society, economics become more uncertain, people get very fascinated by the supernatural and I would place vampires in a class like that. Sightings has discovered a subculture of people who worship and emulate the vampire lifestyle. Are these self-proclaimed vampires true devotees, or do they merely have a morbid fascination with death? There's a growing body of evidence to suggest that these modern-day vampires may do more than simply pose as blood-drinking members of the undead. I believe in another type of vampire I call the living vampire. They'll go around attacking people, biting them on the neck, and drinking their blood. And my way of thinking, they're every bit as dangerous as the old legendary type vampire. In Chicago, Sightings met one member of the vampire subculture who insists he is a real-life vampire. Most people consider me a vampire because I'm a blood drinker. I use blood to... Uh, ensure my immortality in this world. Vlad is a very interesting vampire. He's not quite like any other vampire that has ever contacted me or that I've ever studied. Vlad believes that there is a special kind of reaction he gets 
from the small amounts of blood that he takes. Blood is, uh, uh, has a lot of powerful uh, symbolism and has uh, since ancient times. It's the life force, and any time you consume the life force, then you enhance your own vitality. And blood also has a, an erotic aspect to it as well. I feel Vlad may very well be getting some kind of special insight, some kind of special feeling from blood. Did any of the people you spoke with claim to be dead people who were kept alive by drinking blood? None. In fact, uh, almost all of them apologized for not being dead. Vlad's lifestyle may seem more theater than reality with his thousand dollar handmade porcelain fangs and sculpted coffin. But the practice of blood drinking is not an act. Vlad believes it's proof of his commitment to vampirism. But to outsiders, it appears as nothing more than a desperate attempt for attention. What I do and why I've done it is, is my, I don't, I really don't care if any of you believe it or not. That's your problem. Our long-standing fascination with vampires is well documented, but few people have carried out their fascination, drinking blood and living as vampires. What sends someone over the edge? Is it simply a need to stand out from the crowd? A deep-rooted desire for immortality? Or an unnatural need to participate in a world of evil? To dream about vampires, to be attracted to vampires, for the culture to thrill to the idea of vampires is simply nature. Although it may seem like pure theatrics to us, the self-proclaimed vampires that we interview insist that they have a real dedication to vampirism. Behavior experts argue that their dedication could be masking a psychological disorder. And they're asking the question, what deep need are people like these fulfilling by drinking blood and living as vampires? Coming up, a startling sightings report on witches in America. Do they exist in your town and do they threaten your family? A revealing interview with a real life witch next. The Salem witch trials were a notorious part of our Puritan past, but witches and witchcraft are still alive and well in America today. Modern day witches are a far cry from the evil broomstick riding hags of popular culture. Today's witches are eager to dispel the myths that have plagued what they consider to be their religion. If you're looking for pointed hats and green faces, you'll have better luck at your front door handing out Halloween candy to the neighborhood kids. Selena Fox and her followers are the real thing, witches who make a point of celebrating nature instead of casting spells and concocting evil curses. Calling herself a Wiccan priestess from the old English word Wicca, meaning witch or wizard, Fox practices what she calls a religion from rural Iowa County in Wisconsin. But the intolerance she finds today is not so different from that of the citizens of another small community 300 years ago, Salem, Massachusetts. There was an accepted form of religious and political practice. Those who deviated from that, especially women who were outspoken and independent, were killed. Here in Salem in 1692, 19 people were hanged, and one man was pressed to death because he would not plead guilty or not guilty. William Lemoy heads up the Essex Institute Library in Salem, which houses hundreds of actual court documents from the witch trials. Based on weak testimony supplied by hysterical witnesses, over 200 citizens of Salem were accused of being witches. Petty jealousies, land disputes, grievances held for decades would all be brought into play. I think the underlying context for what happened was fear. When fear is the fundamental emotion, you can expect irrational behavior. And when you get a group acting irrationally, watch out. Joining us now from her farm in Black Earth, Wisconsin, is Selena Fox, a modern day witch who prefers to be called a Wiccan minister. Selena, welcome to Sightings. Thanks, Tim. Happy Halloween. And happy Halloween to you, too. Selena, do you mind being called a witch? I've used the word witch to describe myself and my practice of Wiccan spirituality, but I also use some other terms that are perhaps more specific about what I do. Wiccan minister is one, nature priestess is one, 
And those terms are more specific about the kinds of things that I'm involved in, which is spiritual ministry. What do you think is the biggest misconception that most folks have about witches like you? We are not involved with Satanism or the practice of evil. This is against our values, our ethics. Certainly back in the early days in Salem, witches were persecuted. Does that persist? Is there persecution now? Persecution has not ended in America and other parts of the world for people that are involved not only in witchcraft, but other nature religions. I would like to see persecution and intolerance against our people end. Most people have stereotypes, Selena, about witches, people like you. Where do those stereotypes come from? Some of the stereotypes that we have today around the word witch really come right out of Wizard of Oz. The word witch is being used by people who are practicing a religion that do not look in any way like the Wicked Witch of the West and certainly don't have those kinds of um, practices. Well, here it is Halloween now, Selena. Why is Halloween so important to witches like yourself? Halloween is our new year. We not only pay our respects for the dead, especially family and friends that we have known and loved in this life, but it's a time of looking ahead to the year to come. Selena Fox, thank you and happy Halloween. We'll be back with more sightings in just a moment. Join us next time for new investigations into the unexplained. For sightings, I'm Tim White. Good night. Tomorrow, witness a high-speed chase more exciting than anything you've ever seen in the movies, because it's real. Cops in Denver, an all-new location, an all-new episode tomorrow. Now, stay tuned for more sightings next.